the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you on this first Sunday of the year 2021. Welcome to all of you who are joining us in this time of worship. We worship on this first Sunday of the new year with a mixture of hope, anticipation, fear, excitement, and expectation. We do not know what the year holds for us, but I hope that this time of worship will remind us to trust God and to place everything into God's hands. I want to open this time with words from Psalm 147. The sentiments of the whole psalm convey a sense of peace and relative security. It points out that even though we experience challenges in life, there are many reasons to praise God. Psalm 147. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to God. For he is gracious, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make a melody to our God on the lyre. Please join me in prayer. God of wisdom and truth, at the beginning of this new year, we look back and we look forward. In the year that has passed, we experienced unprecedented circumstances. We experienced fear, uncertainty, and sorrow. We experienced glimmers of joy and hope. We felt blessed and we felt challenged. In this time we take for worship, we are reminded that you are present through it all. We are reminded that we are never alone. We are reminded that nothing can separate us from your love. So at the beginning of this new year, we pause in silence to reflect on the year that has passed. We remember the things from this past year that we are most thankful for. We recall moments we were the happiest. We consider the times we felt most alive. We recognize the times we gave and received the most love. We are grateful, God, that you were present in those times. We also remember the things from this past year that we are least thankful for. We recall the moments we were the least happy. We consider the times we felt life draining from us. We recognize the times we gave and received the least love. We are grateful, God, that you were present in those times too. Gracious God, at the beginning of this new year, we look forward to the year to come. We are confident that you will be with us still, when we are thankful and when we are not, when we are happy and when we are sad, when we feel alive and when we feel drained, when we give and receive love and when we do not. God, the world we live in is a messy and challenging one, a world of pain, a world of doubt, a world of fear, a world of jealousy, a world of violence, a world of domination, a world of justice, a world of human failings. Yet God, you are with us always. So give us grace and give us courage to live faithfully in this imperfect world. As we devote ourselves in service to you, we thank you for everything we have. We ask that what we give in terms of time and financial donations will be blessed by you. Remind us always of the promise of your kingdom emerging around us and through us. It is for this kingdom that we now pray using the words Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The church choir will now sing the German song, Dank sei dir Herr. At the beginning of a new year, this song invites us to reflect on God's guidance in the past and reassures us of God's presence for the time to come. No. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. But take care and watch yourselves closely, so as neither to forget the things that your eyes have seen, nor to let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. I remember going on a road trip years ago when my kids were young. And during the trip, the odometer, that gauge that measures how far the car has gone during its lifetime, rolled over to 100,000 kilometers. Before we had set out on the journey, I knew that this was going to happen. And ever on the lookout, as I was at the time, for ways to keep my kids amused and happy on a long trip, I built this up to be quite a significant event in their minds. First, there will be a whole bunch of nines in a row, I told them. 
And then all the nines will disappear and there will be a one and a bunch of zeros. And then it will start counting from the beginning. Well, wouldn't you know it, when the moment finally came and all those nines rolled over, I was so busy keeping my eyes on the road and the kids in the back were so busy poking each other and trying to establish where the middle of the back seat really is that we all missed the whole event. The beginning of a new year is kind of like the odometer rolling over. All the nines disappear, you hang up a new clean calendar on the wall and you start afresh. Different people, of course, have different feelings about the beginning of a new year. Some of us are so busy trying to dodge the traffic in the road of life, or so busy fighting the little backseat turf wars at work or within our families or our social circles that we don't even notice the start of a new year. Others of us figure, what's the big deal? Isn't New Year's Day just like any other day? And so we just hang up a new calendar on the wall and keep right on going with our lives. Still others of us pause to reflect. Having lived the majority of 2020 under the restrictions of COVID-19, I don't know if I've ever heard so many people say, I can't wait to put this year behind us. Some have even referred to 2020 as the year that wasn't. For some of us, the beginning of the new year represents new possibilities, new hopes, new dreams. Many of us go so far as to make New Year's resolutions in a conscious effort to bring our hopes, aspirations, and dreams into fruition. The unfortunate thing with resolutions is that they can easily leave us feeling the weight of failure and guilt before the year has barely begun. As one person put it, more years than not, as resolutions get broken one by one, we quickly realize that it may be a new year, but it's the same old me. My worst year, this person went on to say, was when I made 10 resolutions. By the end of January, I'd broken most of them. By the end of February, I'd forgotten what they were. The month of January takes its name from the Roman god Janus. Maybe you've seen depictions of Janus as a human figure who has a head with a face that's facing forward and another face that's facing backward. The Romans celebrated the first day of the year with offerings to this deity. Now our Christian faith, of course, doesn't call us to put our trust in or to worship a two-faced God, but our scriptures do repeatedly invite us to look backward reflectively and to look forward purposefully and prayerfully. I wonder if we were to take this invitation to look backward and forward from the perspective of our faith seriously, if the hopes and the dreams that we have might not have more depth and the resolutions that we make or the goals that we set for ourselves might not be more effective in helping us bring those hopes and dreams to fruition. With that question in mind, I invite you this morning to join me in spending a little bit of time on three things. Firstly, looking back and reflecting prayerfully on our past. Secondly, looking forward and reflecting purposefully on our future. And finally, contemplating what it might take for the seeds of our hopes and dreams to bear fruit in Christ. This morning, I'm going to break this sermon into three short reflections based on three scripture passages. Let's start by looking back. The Israelites were no strangers to looking back. They were repeatedly challenged to remember where they'd come from and how graciously God had dealt with them. Moses once encouraged them with the words that Arik read for us earlier. Be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your hearts as long as you live. Recalling God's faithfulness through the difficulties and the triumphs of the past was the foundation on which the Israelites were to build the values that would shape their lives in the land of promise that lay on the horizon. 
As we look toward the horizon before us in this year, it's fitting for us as a people of faith to build our resolutions and our goals on the faithfulness of God who has carried us through the past year. It's important to face our past honestly, our disappointments, our losses, our pain. At the same time, it's important, even in a difficult year, to acknowledge the good things that have happened or the lessons that that year has taught us. This kind of honest reflection can be painful. The last year might be something you'd not necessarily want to remember. On the other hand, it's also possible that there were some things that you want to cling to. Whatever the last year was like for you, it's helpful to spend some time remembering. And so I invite you now to join me in a few minutes of quiet reflection on the year that lies behind us. If you like, I invite you to close your eyes to block out any distractions. Let your mind become a screen onto which to project the significant memories of this past year. Think about those images prayerfully. Hold them up before God. What are the things from this last year that you're thankful for? Take a moment to recall those things. Picture them and offer them up in silent prayer of gratitude. What are some experiences that caused you pain? Perhaps a sense of loss or maybe disappointment. Bring those experiences to mind. I invite you to offer those up to God as well. Are there things that you've said or done this past year that were perhaps hurtful to others? Or maybe patterns of life that have led you further away from God and from trying to live a life of faith? Are there things from the past year for which you're sorry? Things that maybe you never really acknowledged or dealt with, things that still occupy space in the back of your mind. Take a moment to reflect on that and offer these up to God. Ours is a God who loves us unconditionally and wants to free us from the guilt that we carry from our past. Are there lessons you've learned in this past year about life about love, or maybe about what's really important in life. Hold these up before God and give thanks for these discoveries or revelations. Are there habits or patterns of behavior in this past year that you'd like to leave behind? Or are there practices that you see as good and life-giving that you'd like to see grow in you? Take a moment to think of those and hold them up before God. Is there anything else in the year behind us that stands out as significant for you? Good? Bad? Bring it before God. Let's pray. God of love and grace, God, who is able to see past all that we see. We thank you for the year that lies behind us. We thank you for the gifts of goodness and joy that we've experienced. We also thank you for the people around us that help to carry us through the difficulties, the pain, and the sorrows that we've experienced. Above all, we thank you for your grace, your strength, and your faithfulness that has accompanied us through the peaks and the valleys, through the times when we drew near to you and the times when perhaps we strayed away. Help us not to be held captive by this past year, not by its glories, not by its disappointment or its guilt or sorrows. Help us instead to see your prayerful reflections on this past year as the fertile soil in which you plant the seeds of our future. 
Amen. All the chisels I have dulled carving idols of stone that have crumbled like sand neath the waves. I've recklessly built all my dreams in the sand just to watch them all wash away. Through another day, another trial, another chance to reconcile to one who sees past all I see. And reaching out my weary hand, I pray that you'd understand you're the only one who's faithful to me. All the pennies I've wasted in my wishing well I have thrown like stones to the sea I have cast my lots, dropped my guard, searched aimlessly For a faith to be faithful to me Through another day, another trial, another chance to reconcile To one who sees past all I see and reaching out my weary hand, I pray that you'd understand You're the only one who's faithful to me You're the only one who's faithful to me I'm reading from Philippians 3 verses 13 to 14 Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The past is important, and we can learn a lot from reflecting on it. In fact, if we don't, we'll probably just find ourselves repeating the unhealthy patterns from our past. But God doesn't want us to live in the past the Apostle Paul spelled this out when he wrote the words that Aidan just read for us. Forgetting what's behind and straining toward what's ahead, I press on toward the goal. It's not helpful to go into the new year just looking backwards. As we know from when we're walking, if we're just looking backwards over our shoulder, chances are that we'll walk into something that hurts. The main reason that the scriptures call us to reflect on the past is to help us to clarify and better orient ourselves in the direction that God might be calling us forward into the future. So where are you aiming? Where are you setting your sights as this new year begins? There's truth to the old adage that if we aim at nothing, chances are we'll hit it. And so again, I invite you to join me for a moment of prayerful reflection. Again, if you find it helpful, you can close your eyes. Taking what you've learned from the past year and full of hope for what might lie ahead, what are you aiming at this year? Lift that up before God. How does what you're aiming at resonate with the greater purposes of God as you understand it from the Bible and from our Christian faith? In what aspects of your life do you maybe feel the gentle nudge of God leading you towards growth in the year ahead? What might it look like for you to grow in your faith commitment and in your relationship with God in the year ahead. How might God be calling you to care for yourself in the coming year? How might God help you to grow in having healthy relationships with others, in your family, in the church, at work or school, in your social circle? How might God be inviting you to rethink how you use your time, your energy, your money? Let's pray again. Loving and gracious God, 
So often the resolutions that we make and the goals that we set for ourselves are determined by the media and the dominant culture around us. Sometimes the pursuit of those goals destroys our self-esteem or leaves us feeling empty and disconnected from your loving will. Free us from the desires to look like supermodels and to live lifestyles of the rich and famous. Free us from those things that distract us. Help us instead to make resolutions that draw us nearer to you. Help us to pursue personal goals that resonate with your will and bear the fruits of your kingdom in the world. As we move into a new year, Lord, tune our hearts to resonate with yours. Amen. Oh uh-huh. 
count of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain fixed upon it Mount of God's unchanging love A reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 14 to 17. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died, and he died for all, so that those who might live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we no longer know him in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Having reflected prayerfully on the year that's passed and having looked purposefully at the year that lies ahead, we might be left wondering about a few things. Like, how do we actually go about pursuing resolutions or goals in a way that's effective in producing fruit that lasts? How do we go about taking the leap? How do we keep from getting overwhelmed? How do we keep from getting discouraged when we fall short? I invite you to consider six steps. The first one is to let go. Every gardener knows that you can't expect to see new life emerge from the soil unless you let go of the seed that you're holding in your hand. As long as you're clinging to the seed, it can never be transformed and grow into a new plant. In the same way, if we're serious about personal growth in the new year, if we really want to experience transformation, then we have to be willing to let go of our past no matter how much security or comfort we may find in that past. Clinging to our past, whether positive or negative, can paralyze us from embracing new opportunities and potential and from experiencing growth. The passage that Caitlin just read for us uses language as strong as dying and becoming a new creation to drive that point home. The second step in making resolutions towards growth is to begin by focusing on the patterns that will help us keep the overarching vision and direction that we're pursuing before our eyes. Our passage talks not just about becoming a new creation, but becoming a new creation in Christ. Jesus embodied God's vision, God's dream, God's ultimate goal, in everything that he did and said. As followers of Jesus, it would make sense that we set our primary goal, holding Jesus and God's overarching vision before our eyes. We can do that by nurturing a practice of prayer, perhaps by getting to know our Bible better, by staying in touch with other believers who are also aiming in the same direction and pursuing the same ultimate goal, by worshiping regularly. It couldn't actually be any more convenient than it is right now with online services that you can tune into at any time in the comfort of your own home. But it still requires a level of commitment and priority to actually do that. If we make it our primary resolution to establish patterns of behavior that hold God's ultimate vision before our eyes, then it's from there that all of our other goals will grow. A third step is to be realistic in the resolutions that we make. Don't expect to achieve everything in one year. Be realistic in the number of resolutions that you make 
and be realistic in the degree of change that you expect in a given amount of time. Physical fitness is, of course, a very common New Year's resolution. But if you want to take care of your body and improve your fitness, maybe don't aim to run a full marathon in two months. And if you've got bad knees, maybe running isn't the best approach for you at all. Ask yourself, what can you realistically do? If you want to develop a better relationship with your children, then maybe start by spending an hour more a week with them, doing things that they like. If you want to grow in your relationship with God, you don't necessarily have to resolve to spend an hour of day at 5.30 in the morning in prayer. Maybe you're not a morning person. It may make more sense for you to make it your goal this year to set aside 15 minutes each day to engage with God in some way that's meaningful to you. I'm not saying we shouldn't challenge ourselves. I'd encourage all of us to set our sights high and to commit ourselves to those things in our lives that we feel are most important. But it is important to be realistic and optimistic, to do so in ways that are life-giving and that build us up, in ways that cause us to grow and not to despair and give up. Most of the metaphors of personal growth and transformation that we find in the Bible are images from creation. New shoots growing out of old stumps, branches being rooted in a vine, new growth that comes from pruning, mustard seeds growing into giant trees, and so on. But notice that as we observe God's creation, we see that healthy growth in nature is always incremental, one bit at a time. As you pursue goals and carry out resolutions, keep that in mind. A fourth step is to accept help from experts when needed. If, for example, you feel that God is calling you to make some lifestyle changes to improve your physical well-being, it may be a good idea to talk to your doctor or to read some books or find some reputable online resources. If you feel that God is nudging you to nurture and perhaps give needed attention to your marriage. You might want to talk to one of the ministers or get a referral for a qualified counselor. Or maybe again, it's a matter of finding good resources about communication and about dealing with conflict written by qualified authors. If you feel God challenging you to confront addictive behavior, whether it's substances, smoking, gambling, pornography, computer games, workaholism, or whatever. It's very difficult to tackle these on our own. In any case, I think you get my point. Sometimes resources or professional help can go a long way in helping us move towards growth and transformation in a healthy way. A fifth step is to be accountable. Don't try to do it on your own. Share your resolutions with people that you trust. Get others to help you, and you help them. Surround yourself with a circle of support and be a support to others. People who would encourage you and ask you in a supportive, not judging way, how is it actually going with those resolutions? People who are rooting for you. None of us was made to do it on our own. Well, the last step is don't let setbacks define you as a failure. As a people who are pursuing the kingdom of God as their ultimate goal, we are a people rooted in grace. I remember telling my daughter once as I was driving her to perform a solo piano piece at the Winnipeg Music Festival, good musicians are not those who never make mistakes. Good musicians are those who are able to keep going even when they make mistakes. God's grace is what frees us to keep going when we make mistakes or have setbacks in pursuing our resolutions or goals. When we experience a setback, it's good to acknowledge it, to try to understand why it happened or how it happened. But then we need to let go, and we need to go back to step one, letting go and then moving forward again to step two, focusing on the patterns of behavior that hold the overarching goal of God's kingdom and God's transforming grace before us. 
and from there we let the process continue. If you've ever looked at the cross section of a giant tree trunk, you will probably have noticed that there are growth rings in the wood. And there are wider, light-colored rings from seasons of rapid growth, but there are also thinner, dark-colored rings from seasons of stunted or distressed growth. Notice, though, that as long as the tree was living, even in the seasons of stunted growth, there was still growth. Even as we have setbacks in our resolutions and goals, even as we lean on God's grace repeatedly and go back to step one and let go of our setbacks and start again, as long as we hold up God's larger vision and purpose for our lives and take steps toward it, we will continue to grow and be transformed into the image of the one who is transforming us. I want to close by inviting you into one last prayerful reflection, which will also serve as our benediction. I invite you to join me in an ancient contemplative prayer that I learned years ago, one that has helped me, especially in times where I've intentionally sought to orient or reorient my thoughts and my goals and my life with Christ. I will repeat the prayer three times and invite you to join me by saying it aloud or silently the last time. Let's pray. Christ, be in my heart and in my loving. Christ, be in my life and in my living. Christ, be in my mouth and in my speaking. Christ, be in my ears and in my hearing. Christ, be in my eyes and in my seeing. Christ, be in my mind and in my understanding. Christ, be in my heart and in my loving. Christ, be in my life and in my living. Christ, be in my mouth and in my speaking. Christ, be in my ears and in my hearing. Christ, be in my eyes and in my seeing. Christ, be in my mind and in my understanding. Christ, be in my heart and in my loving. Christ, be in my life and in my living. Christ, be in my mouth and in my speaking. Christ, be in my ears and in my hearing. Christ, be in my eyes and in my seeing. Christ, be in my mind and in my understanding. Amen. Abounds in deep.
Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger. In the presence of my Savior Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders Let me walk upon the waters Wherever you would call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior.